small carry-on. Yes. All right. And, um, okay, it's going to be good. Um, through the week, while you guys are gone, we're going to be praying. Our prayer team is going to be praying for you, um, fasting for you. Um, Pastor and I are truly going to be fasting. We've got two kids that are going to be going, too. Um, and so we need God to do some things in their life, in our family's life, and we're all together on the same page. They know that we're going to be fasting for them while they're gone, and um, so we're excited about that. All right, are you ready to get to the Word today? Amen. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for allowing us to be together. Thank you for our guests that came in, and Lord, I, I pray that they would not be overwhelmed with everything that's going on, but instead that they would see that Restore is a, is a safe place to land and a soft place to fall. It is a place where we um, are family, where we may come in and, um, and be a guest, but after we recognize that we're guests in this house, that they recognize that they're no longer guests, but they're family as well. And Father, we're, we're so thankful that they've taken the time to come and to worship with us today. For all of us who got out of our beds this morning and came here to worship and honor you, it is about you. It's not about us. It's not about Anthony and Jennifer. We serve Christ. We don't, we don't do anything for our own gain, but Lord, only for you. We love you, and we're so thankful that you're going to place and impart this word inside of us. You're going to change us forevermore, helping us to know and understand how important words are and how important it is that we watch the things that come from our mouths because they start right there down deep inside of our heart. Lord, we're so thankful for it, and we ask your blessing upon this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We, um, we have been preaching Grounded for Life. We've been talking about that series. If you're brand new with us today, um, you don't have to catch up on anything. Every single message has been standing on its own two feet. We call it Grounded for Life because um, if you look up in that tree, there's a whole lot of root system there. And that root system is so valuable and important to make that tree strong. And if we don't have a correct root system, if we don't know who we are, if we don't know that we're um, loved and accepted and valuable and forgiven, if we don't know who we are in Christ, if we don't know whose we are, then we don't know who we are. So we've been talking about that. We've been talking about the foundations of our faith. We've been talking about the word, like what's in the word and how, how come it says this and what does it mean? And, and I've always heard this or this happened in my life and, and what does the Bible say about that? So we have made this as interactive as possible where we have a... a um, a box in the back and we've asked you to submit questions first five weeks it was like pulling teeth to get questions and now they are coming in like by the handfuls and that's good so we don't know how long the series will last we only know that what we're trying to do is clear out some of the clutter we're trying to uh, make sure that we understand what it is that we believe so that when the winds of change come in our lives that we are grounded enough in our faith to be able to stand on our own two feet and not have to be propped up by anybody but the holy spirit yeah, amen and so um we've been talking about about a lot of things. Uh, today we're going to talk about something extremely important. How important are words? Let's take a look at this video real quickly and uh, we're going to talk today about the importance of our words. to my scene. I wrote the scene, but in different words. Thanks, love.
Change your words. Change your world. Words are powerful. If you agree with that, say amen. Amen. All right, so we're talking about the importance of words today, and I'll tell you why. Um, we had several questions that got submitted all around the topic of our words. And um, so we, we chose three of them that, that was really strongly in that same vein, in that same line. And uh, we're going to tell you what those three questions were. None of them were submitted by myself, I promise. Um, the first five weeks when we were having trouble getting some questions in, um, before you really understood the concept and understood that you can put anything anonymous back there. Um, and we will try to answer it. Uh, three of these questions, all pertaining to words. You ready? The first one was this. What does the Bible say about taking the Lord's name in vain? Um, somewhere in there, um, I, I think it was more of a paragraph, but it talked about um, is it important what we say and the words that we speak is, uh, you know, it, it referred to cussing, and, um, and I'm pretty sure that this person has some teenagers, and there's this wrestling match over this thing about taking the Lord's name in vain. And, um, and what does the Bible say about it? Because I'm going to put my kid in the seats, and I need you to preach to him. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and so that was the very first question. Question number two, as a Christian, does it matter what we say and how we speak? Huh. We're going to be good today. You ready? Mm -hmm. and, good. and then there was a final question, and you're going to go, well, does this have to do with words? It absolutely does. It has to do with attitudes, but when we really come down to it, it comes from the same vein of the issue, and here was the question. Why do Christians, listen to this, why do Christians easily accept and believe gossip, lies, and slander about other Christians from Christians without trying to seek the truth? That's, That's a great question, right? That's a great question. So we're just going to dig that out. Is anybody ready for that this morning? We're going to take a look at what the Word says. Let's take the first one. All right, guys, question number one. What, uh, what does the Bible say about taking the Lord's name in vain? Do you realize Deuteronomy 5 and verse 11 is the third commandment, and it says do not, I repeat, do not take the name of the Lord in in vain. What does vain mean? It means to misuse the name. Think about this. According to Webster's Dictionary, to use someone's name in such a way that shows a lack of respect. That's what the Bible says. When we take the Lord's name in vain, we, we show a lack of respect. It also means useless, producing no result. Now, guys, I, I did a little bit of research. Let me, let's dig deep today, all right? Now's not the time to lean back. Now's the time to lean up. Come on. So here's what I'm going to say. L listen, let me lay the foundation quickly for this question. Because of the greatness of God's name, because his name is high and lifted up. Mm -hmm. Remember, when Jesus referred to the name of God in the model prayer in the Gospels, he talked about God's name is hallowed or holy. So if God's name is holy, any, watch this, any use of his name that brings dishonor on him or his character is taking his name in vain. Let's go further. There is a larger sense in which people today take the Lord's name in vain. What does that consist of? Those who name the name of Christ. Watch this. Those who pray in Jesus' name. Who take his name as a part of their identity. But who deliberately and continually disobey his commandments are taking his name in vain. Are you with me so far? Hmm. Let's go on. I when we take the name Christian, which means Christ-like, are you with me so far? When we take that name upon ourselves, we do so with an understanding of all that it signifies. Watch this. If we profess to be Christians, but act. You ready? Think. And speak in a worldly or profane manner. We take his name in vain. Hmm. Okay, so um, with taking the Lord's name, I've always thought of it this way, and, and to kind of break it down, because it's pretty simple. But when we're taking on a name, it would be equivalent of, um, of us trying to get in some place that was really hard to get to. And showing up at the door and the bouncer, whether it be showing up at the White House and, and not being able to get in, it would be like literally using someone that's already inside, using their name as our access to get in. 
Does that make sense? So I show up at the White House and they go, excuse me, ma'am, I don't know you. And if I'm able to drop the right name, I'm getting in. Are are you with me? So as Christians, we're taking on the name of Jesus Christ. We are saying, I'm with him. And as a result of that, we have access to so many things. And what it also means to be taking it in vain with that word useless and producing no result is this. I'm taking his name and I'm getting into the party. I'm getting into the White House. I'm using him for access. But yet when I get there, then I'm acting the fool and I'm a total idiot once I'm inside. Is anybody with me? Yeah. I took on his name, and what I'm saying is, is I'm, I'm here, I'm with him, and it gives us access, but when we get there, because we took on his name, it's important that while we're there, that we are acting accordingly. Does that make sense? So while it is about um, the words, we want you to understand that it's also about the actions and the heart behind it. With that said, it is 100% absolutely yes this person's asking is that a sin what does the bible say it is it is absolutely a sin and i want you to understand something else too that that we believe we want to take a whole nother step forward is this um with our mouths we can sin and offend god i've also known people that with that same mouth they may jump on somebody that says, don't say that, that's taking the Lord's name in vain. But with their mouth, they will also slander people, talk about people, gossip about people, and think nothing of it. Wow. Is anybody with me? Well, There's a saying that I've always loved, don't judge me because I sin differently than you. Yeah. Because here's the thing. We've met people in 20 years of ministry that are dogmatic about one thing and really loose about others. Is anybody with me? They're the same people, and I'm thinking of a a, a man specifically who is real big on that, on, on, hey, don't take, oh, don't um, don't do that. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Oh, that's a sin. But yet, you go to a restaurant with him, and he'll use his mouth to sit there as a married man and make all kinds of comments to the waitress about the waitress talking to, are you with me? So we have to understand that it's not to say, oh, well, you know what? Yours is this and mine is that. No, no, no. The fact is, is our goal is to do and to be what we talked about weeks ago when we talked about sanctification. We put Jesus into our heart. He gives us access to the party, right? But then that's just the beginning. That's just the starting line. Now that we're Christians, our goal is to spend our entire lives while we're left on this planet trying to become more like him through the Spirit. And so when you find someone who says, I'm a Christian, I think sometimes we use that word Christian so loosely. Is anybody with me? So we're going to talk about that today because absolutely to answer the question, that is a a sin, to take the Lord's name in vain. We can go as far as to say, okay, so saying God, that that's, you know, there's a saying that says, you know, God's last name isn't, damn it, right? We've heard that before, right? A lot of people will say that. I get that. And here's the deal. Some people will say, oh, you know what? Gosh is a variation of God. Here's the deal. We can get into all of that, but it really comes down to this. Where is your heart? And is our goal every day to become more like Christ? And if that is our goal, and if that is what God expects of us, then absolutely that is a sin. And we need to make sure that our mouths are being used for the right things. What are the right things? To glorify God to lift him up and to lift one another up, to edify not only Christ, but to edify each other and be there for one another and to make sure that we are trying to do that in all areas of our life, not just in one, if that makes sense. Let's go on to the next question and see if we can bring this up. Oh, it's going to be good today. Let's look at the next question. As a Christian, does it matter what we say and how we speak? I'm about to drop the bomb. You ready? Yes, it does. So quiet in here. The Bible, oh, you're quiet today. Come on. <laughs> Ephesians 5 and verse 4 says, Let there be no filthiness, Yikes. nor foolish talk, nor crude joking. Oh, I'm a man. It don't matter. We say things. Come on, it's locker room talk. Mm. I'm going to keep going. Yes. What's Dude. the Bible say? Which are out of place. 
But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Come on, guys. We got we to gotta give praise and pops to our pops, right? Praise and props. We don't need to tear people down with our tongue. We need to build people up. But we also need to watch what we say. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody today. Ephesians 4.29, watch your talk. That's what Paul said, right? Mm. Watch your talk, no bad I heard a person say, well, you know, the Bible don't say nothing about cussing. Mm-hmm. No bad words. Come on, guys, right? <laughs> That's what the Bible, come on, I didn't make it up. No bad words should be coming from your mouth. Mm-hmm. Say amen or me. Come on, guys. And me. Say what is good. Your word should help other people. People or others grow as Christians or believers. There it is. Mm -hmm. So in both instances with taking the Lord's name in vain, as well as what we speak and how important it is, um, it really comes down to that word sanctification that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, that we, we start off with Christ, that's our starting line, and then every day we are growing more like him. And if we give him permission to interrupt us, we're giving him permission to tap us on the shoulder and say, hey, what you just said, don't say that. See, the goal is not to say, what can I do and get away with and still go to heaven, right? Like, hey, can I do this and still be okay? We're asking the wrong question, right? If we have to ask the question, it's like I told Jordan when she was packing for youth camp. She said, Mom, can I take this to youth camp or, you know, or is it to like, you know, and she couldn't find the word. Or is it to, you know, small or skanky or tight or whatever she was trying to say, right? But when she brought, it was a dress that she would wear down here, but the center had little, like, little holes in it, tiny little holes in it that kind of divided the thing. And, and so um, she's worn it before around, but when she brought it into my room and she held it up, she goes, hey, Mom what do you think about this? And she paused, I paused, and before I even answered the question, she looked at me and she goes, I guess if I have to ask, I already know the answer, right? Absolutely. So the goal is not that we go, hey, what can I still do and still get into heaven? The goal really should be, Lord, how much closer can I get to you? And if I get to heaven and he goes, hey, you just kept too much of those things, We're so good. That's how I always look at it because I want to be more like Christ and I want to be able to help other people grow. And there are times, and and, and Stephen and I think have had this conversation a lot. He was a Marine. He is a Marine. He said, you know, with being a Marine comes a Marine's mouth. You ever heard of a sailor's mouth, right? So here's the deal. We live so long in our old lives that it doesn't happen immediately that everything has changed. The goal is, and our job is, is to begin sanctifying and becoming more like Christ, and that starts with renewing our mind, allowing the Holy Spirit to get in there and go, hey, by the way, that's not your best you. You know what I mean? It's not about getting to heaven or, 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 or being sent. It, it's not about that. It's about representing me well, taking my name, getting into the party, and representing yourself well. So that's really what we need to be looking at. Here is the next question. Why do Christians easily accept or believe lies, slander from other Christians about Christians without trying to seek truth? Well, um, I want to take this question because the word Christian appears there three times in that question, and here's what I think. We use that word Christian so unbelievably loosely. Perhaps what we should be doing is using the word believer because Christian means Christ-like. So let's read the question over again. Why would somebody Christ-like easily accept and believe gossip, slander, um, and lies about other Christ-like people from Christ-like people without trying to seek the Lord? I see no Christ-likeness in any of that question. Is is anybody following what I'm trying to say? Because how many of you realize that we can be believers and still not be Christ-like? Amen. Yeah. Aren't you guys glad you came today? This is here. This is what we thought. We figured this would be a great weekend to tackle this because we're going to have 29 youth get on a bus. And this will really help our youth pastors and leaders to be able to go, hey guys, in the back of the bus, watch your mouths. Remember what was taught today. See, see how we've helped you? Isn't that good? Okay, James 1 and 26 says this, you might think that you are a very religious person. Oh my. 
You might think you're a very religious person, but if your tongue is out of control, you're fooling yourself. Your careless talk makes you makes your offerings to God worthless. Yikes. So here's the point. If we are Christ-like, we won't be gossiping and lying and slandering. Do you realize that that is one of the other commandments is do not murder? And you're going to go, there's no murder up in there. Yeah, the word slander actually means murder. So it means to murder someone's character. If I talk about you, if you've done something and I go to 15 people to get them all on board with, um, with looking at you funny because of what you just did, I'm slandering your character. I'm murdering your character. And we're going to talk about how, 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 important that is to God and how it needs to be important to us because the word slander is literally murdering somebody's character and we don't have a right to do that so we can think that we're very religious that we are believers but we're not really being Christ-like and so here's the deal Um, the reason why those things happen is because everything that comes out of our mouths is coming from our heart when people talk about me and people um, are having meetings about me this is what I know I may have done something, but the deal is, is if I've done something, come to me. And if you're gathering about it, then the problem really remains inside of you, not in me, if that makes sense. So why does it happen? It happens because someone's not checking their heart. Someone's calling themselves Christians and very religious people, but they're just simply a believer who's not sanctified, who's not watching their words, and who's not doing what Christ wants, and therefore we can call ourselves Christians all day long, but really the true measure of a Christian is if they're Christ-like, and we all have moments that we're not. There are, ask my neighbors, there are moments I am not Christ-like. There are not many of my neighbors directly next to me sitting in these pews, right, in the seats. No, I'm kidding. But the thing is, is that most of us know the difference of a believer and a Christian. And our goal is to be believers who are also Christ-like. That is the goal. So if we're doing that, we're not lining up with who God says we should be. Let's, one more time, let's look at this verse, James 1.26. You might think you're very religious person, but if your tongue is out of control, have you been there, anybody? You are fooling yourself. Your careless talk makes your offerings to God worthless. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been about to bust and tell somebody what you really thought and what you wanted to say and you knew if you said it, you would tear them completely to pieces? Have you been there, anybody? Come on, can I get some bold answers today? Let me see you. Let's, come on, honest people. But can I tell you, it was Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers, that said this. I found this online. I want to share it with you. He said, remember not only to say the right thing in the right place, but far more difficult still to leave unsaid the wrong thing at the tempting moment. You know, Proverbs 21, 23 says, watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you'll stay out of trouble. Oh boy. Come on, that'll preach, man. That's good. Isn't that awesome? Watch your tongue, keep your mouth shut, and you will stay out of trouble. Can I tell you? Go ahead. Is there anybody here that's a below the belter? A below the belter. Um, If someone hurts you, you're hitting lower and you're hitting harder. Anybody? Can I see a show of hands? Come on. This is a place where we can be a work in progress. I need to see. Listen, every couple, every, there's normally one that's better with words, better at manipulation, better at hit and blow the belt. It's not necessarily a good thing. I think you know which one I am. Go ahead. Listen, guys, our tongue will get us in trouble every single time. Can I get a witness? Every time. You know, in James chapter 3, James being Jesus' little brother, remember we talked about that? In James chapter 3, it tells us that our tongue is wild, evil, and full of deadly poison. We've got to tame it. James 3 compares the tongue to a bit, a bridle, and a horse's mouth, and a rudder on a boat. What does that mean? It means a small thing can control something large. Mm. James 3, 5 through 10, let's look at this. The Bible says our tongue is a small part of the body, but it can boast about doing great things. A big forest fire can be started with only a little flame. Listen to this. The tongue is like a 
fire. James is saying a spark can set off a forest fire, and so can the words of your mouth. Watch this. Wow. And what happens in a fire? Devastation and destruction. Mm -hmm. What happens when we run our mouth and say things we shouldn't say? Devastation and destruction. Are you with me? Let's go on. It is a world of evil among the parts of our body. It spreads this evil through our whole body and starts a fire that influences all of life. Watch this. It gets his fire from hell. Wow. Mm. Hmm. Humans have control over every kind of wild animal, bird, reptile, and fish, and they have controlled all these things. Watch this. But no one can control the tongue. Hmm. It's wild, evil, full of deadly poison. We use our tongues to praise our Lord and Father, but then we curse people who are created in God's likeness. Somebody say, ouch. These praises and curses come from the same mouth. James said, my brothers and sisters, this should not happen. Hmm. The goal is to ask the Holy Spirit to begin changing that in us. It doesn't mean that we're always going to get it right, but it does mean that as we become more Christ-like on a daily basis, that we will notice when we miss it. Mm -hmm. yeah. We will notice when we miss it. And then you got to tackle something else, and that's called pride. And that pride is what we have to tackle in order to go somebody and say, hey, um, I totally tore you down with my words. I said something I shouldn't have. And we don't need to say, I don't know where that came from. Because what did we learn from it came from within? We did a whole series on it came from within. When we say, I don't know where that came from, what do we really know? That it came from our heart. Everything starts a lot lower than our mouths. It starts right there in our heart. Let's look at James 3, 14 through 16. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Everything comes not from the mouth, but lower from the heart. The words that we speak truly affect what's going on inside of us. So a lot of times when you see somebody that has a very harsh mouth and very, um, they're, they're very um, hurtful with their words, what we need to do as Christians is sometimes what we do is, and words hurt, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment, words absolutely hurt. There is no such thing as sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. How many of you have ever been hurt by words? Oh, come on. Absolutely. How many of you have ever hurt somebody with your words? And sometimes for us below the belters, it's, uh, it's intentional. You hurt me, I'm coming after you. And when we recognize that in us, the goal should be to say, I don't want to be this way, Lord. This is not who you've made me to be. This is not my best. This is not preserving my life or the life of my marriage or my family or my relationships. And here's the thing, Matthew 12 and 34 says this, for whatever is in your heart determines what you say. I need to be able to know that when I was first married to Anthony, I was one that because I, I, I was that person that continued to hit below the belt and hurt. And here's the deal, I had to recognize and the Holy Spirit worked on the inside of me because I hated it. I would go into the bathroom, I would look myself in the mirror and I would, I would, I would go, what is wrong with you? You were evil have you ever had one of those conversations with yourself like what is going on in you and what I had to begin to say is Lord what's going on in me that's making that come out of my mouth I, I, I'm hurting him and I don't mean to hurt him but I am and sometimes I do mean to why and the Lord had to begin to show me there's always a why behind our what and we've got we've got to understand that for every fruit there's a root for every fruit, there's a root, and you got to sometimes dig a little deeper and inspect what's really going on below the surface so that we can start to heal that. Why do I hurt you with my words? Because I'm hurting. Right. Because of somebody's words somewhere in my life. Yeah. And I can go to the healer and say, Lord, I need you to heal up what's on the inside of me because it makes me angry. And anger says, you owe me. You will pay. And so when anger comes out and those words are coming out of my mouth, it's because something deeper is going on in my heart. Um, the ESV says it like this, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The message version, we learned all of these last week, right? Some of them are word for word. Some of them are thought for thought. The message version is uh, the version that takes a paraphrase. And here's the paraphrase version of this. It's your heart, not the dictionary, that gives meaning to your words. Wow. It's your heart, not your dictionary, that gives meaning to your words. Here's the deal, guys. Y'all, that's problem. good preaching. Y'all just need to say amen. 
This is way better sermon than you're acting like. I'll just tell you that right now. Here's the, here's the deal. Our biggest problem is not our external condition. It's our internal condition that, that affects our eternal condition. Are you with me? And our eternal position. That's right. See, our hearts are the source of all things, right? And what comes out of them, in other words, our words matter to everybody, especially to our loving Heavenly Father. Amen? Let's go on. So we're going to wrap it up like this. Whether it's taking God's name in vain, whether it's cussing, whether it's cursing someone, where we literally speak death over them, we speak words of, you'll never make it. My daddy told me you weren't worth nothing, and he was right. That's how you curse somebody. You speak blessings or cursings over somebody. That's what that is. Um, Whether we're taking the Lord's name in vain, cussing, cursing, whether we're slandering or murdering somebody, whether we're speaking foul talk around a around a water cooler somewhere. Um, Words matter. We saw it in the video when we first started. Words absolutely matter. Um, I want you to take a look at this little picture right here. And uh, remember that be sure to taste your words before you spit them out of your mouth. Okay, let's look at three things that words are. We're going to wrap it up in this way. Number one, words are powerful. Sticks and stones do break bones. They do hurt. Words hurt even worse. Absolutely even worse. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. What are we speaking? Are we speaking death over people? Are we speaking life over people? Are we understanding that whatever's coming out of them is coming from a place in them that still needs healing? And are we the ones that can extend grace so that in that interim that God can begin changing their heart so that it could change their mouth? Amen. Let me show you this. I love this. Some of you have seen this online. Absolutely love this. The mind of a child is fragile. Their emotions touch their future. Your words shape their destiny. If you can look really, really close, it says things like, um, brat, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for you. Um, This is your own fault. Um, I've always cringed when somebody will speak over the child. He's a monster because there's something to that. And I think that we'll probably do an entire series um, on our words and on blessings and on cursings, but today we're just gonna scratch the surface. That's big, guys, that's big, because words do stick around. We'll learn about that in just a second, but first and foremost, they are absolutely powerful. Guys, can I tell you today that our words can steal or heal, discourage or encourage, condemn or mend, Bury us or build us up. Remember, there's life and death in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 10.31, out of the message version, I love this. It says, a good person's mouth is a clear fountain, a clear fountain of wisdom. A foul mouth is a stagnant swamp. Can I tell you, a, a fountain has running water, and it's clear, and there's life there. But you know what's in a stagnant swamp? Something that stinks and is rotten. Come on, guys. So if we say negative things... What we're saying is something that's rotten and has death instead of something that brings life. Can you say amen? Now, here's the thing about words. They're powerful. Why? Because they build others up. You realize we have potential to speak positive words over people? Psalm 107, verse 20, the the King, King David was saying that God sent his word to heal them. Come on, words can heal and words can make whole. Can you say amen? See, words have the potential to uh, bring a compliment or a cut down, but it's our choice. You know, Solomon said in Proverbs 25, verse 11, he said, a a word, watch this, a word that is spoken at the right time in the right place is as beautiful as a gold apple in a silver basket. You know what that was? That was a picture proving that positive words are perfect, Powerful and priceless. Can you say amen? Now let's look at the next part. Words are powerful. They're also pricey or expensive. Here's the deal. There is a thing called freedom of speech, but our words are not free. They are not free. We will absolutely pay for every single one of them. And so sometimes we hide behind certain things and we, we make cutting remarks or we, we're really good at sticking jabs in there in the middle of something with a smile on our face and then we go, oh, I'm just joking. Does anybody know anybody that is a jokester? That there is massive sarcasm 
just it's just drips over every word and it's their way to just dig you and then just smile about it and just go oh I didn't mean that how many of you realize that there's always a fragment of truth inside of everything and it does dig let's look at what the bible says about proverbs 8, uh, 12 18 it says this words are pricey some people make cutting remarks but the words of the wise bring healing. Our words can pierce like swords, even when we're joking. Um, I, last night we were looking at all these verses and, and there's so many that we had to pull out because otherwise we would have been here all day. Um, but the deal is this, is, is, is it talks about how, um, uh, there's a verse I wanna say that it's in Psalms or Proverbs and it talks about how to sit there and to throw darts, fiery darts out into this forest and out into, um, uh, out into a field and then to say to your neighbor, oh, I'm just joking, is ridiculous. The harm has already been done. I just shot firing arrows into the woods surrounding our house. I'm just joking. No, you completely inserted something that started a massive problem and you can't take that back. And so we can't just say, oh, I'm just joking because sometimes when we throw things out there, they're hitting places that have already maybe been said to us and they may be true and they're very cutting. Sometimes people just need to change, but the fact of the matter is, I need the Holy Spirit to change me. I don't need you to cut me. Um, that's awesome. Okay, here we go. Um, that reminds me of an app we're going to talk about, and that's okay. Don't be embarrassed by that. I totally get that. It's happened to me a million times. So, some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Anthony's got a great story. Hey guys, listen, words are pricey. In other words, they cost us something, right? Uh, several years ago, when Cole was playing rec league football, I had the awesome uh, responsibility of being a coach. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I didn't know how to coach. I, I was asked to be there by a friend of mine. He said, man, can you just sit on the sideline and encourage the kids? I, I can do that. Mm -hmm. I was a favorite coach because I always let them have a water break. Come on, guys. <laughs> yeah. But I remember one particular day, we were on the sidelines. And look, man, I, you, if you know me, I'm non-confrontational. I usually run the other way. Somebody says something, I'll let it go in one ear and out the other. Uh, this particular day, we were playing a team. Man, they had beat us like a dog. I mean, they had ran up the score. I wouldn't. I don't like to lose. Can I get a witness, somebody? And, and then when your kids play and they lose, it's even worse than ever. Amen. So here's what happened. We were getting the brakes beat off of us. <laughs> this ref was not calling anything. I mean, man, late hits, out of bounds. I mean, they were jumping off sides. I was about to lose my mind. So after a late hit, which literally, uh, Cole was out of bounds, and they hit him. Two or three guys hit him. I about lost it. So I'm trying to keep my sanctification because I usually lost it every Saturday. Come on, guys, right? So here's what happened. I remember walking up to the ref as God is my witness. I walked up to him and said, hey, man, I don't mean to complain. You know what that means, right? <laughs> I looked at him and said, hey, man, I don't mean to complain. And then he looked at me and said, yes, you do, or you wouldn't say that. Something clicked inside of this old redneck. Come on, guys. And I looked at him and said, you know what, dude, I do mean to complain. And let me tell you something. Now, I didn't, I didn't say any bad words, but I let him have it pretty good. I let him know that people's going to get hurt. That was my boy out there that was getting hit out of bounds. And, man, and, and, and look, thank God it didn't escalate any further. Or I really would have showed my butt. Come on, guys, right? I'm the pastor. I can say that in church. Come on, can I get a witness? Listen, and, and, and then I walked away, and I felt horrible because I showed my true colors that day. And if any of you know me, I usually never, ever let that happen, ever. Well, six months passed by. It was football season, and then it was baseball season. I'm in a concession stand working because I had a daughter playing softball and a son playing baseball. And a, as a parent, you got to work concession stand. So I'm in there in a concession stand working that thing like a, like a champ. And all of a sudden, a referee walks in, and I have some people that used to go to the church, friends of ours, before I started pastoring and evangelizing, says, hey, Anthony, let me introduce you to a friend of ours. <laughs> yes, it was. The referee looked at me, and I didn't recognize him, but he recognized me. He looked at me and goes, man, I know you. And I thought, man, this dude saw me in church. 
Come on, guys. I think he heard me preach. Maybe he's going to give a compliment. I don't know. And uh, he said, I remember you, man. I said, oh, yeah, how's that? He goes, you ripped me a new one on the football field. I said, how's that? He goes, yeah, I remember you, man. You, uh, you complained because y'all were getting beat so bad. And come on, my temper began to boil again. He goes, I remember you, man. He goes, you let me have it pretty good that day. He said, you're a preacher? I grinned and had to bear it. Can I tell you that I pretty much ruined my testimony that day. Yeah. What took me years and decades to build took me seconds to destroy because I let my temper get the best of me and I spoke something in my heart and I knew better. But that cost me that day. Guys, words are pricey. Amen? Yeah. Um, first of all, I love when he gets to tell a story about his mouth, because that rarely ever happens, and you know I'm always having to confess that to you about mine. Um, in marriage, I said a moment ago that there's normally one that's more vocal, more cutting, and the other one that just takes it. And here's the deal on that. We may be winning the argument for those of us spouses in the building or for any of us who are, have a relationship that we do that in. We may be winning the argument because we're really good at manipulating and taking words and turning them around and, and, and really hurting people with it. We may be winning the argument in that moment or maybe always, maybe you're the one that always wins the argument, but here's the deal. Um, we have to realize that we're losing the agreement to honor, to love, and to protect one another's heart. So we may be winning the argument in that moment, but we are absolutely losing the agreement between us. And that takes its toll and it's costly. So we have to be very careful about the words that come out of our mouths. Last one, words are permanent. Can't take them back once they're out there. Can't take them back. Matthew 12, 37, and I tell you this, you must give account on judgment day for every idle word that's, that you speak. Can I just tell you that we may be able to get away with it here but we will stand before God and have to give account for every idle word. Scare anybody. That scares me. For by your words you will be justified, by your words you will be condemned. Guys, words are permanent. They last forever as long as you live. You've heard my story. Uh, man, I grew up in front of a junkyard. My daddy was a town drunk. My brothers were drug dealers. In and out of jail, rehab, prison, whole nine yards. I grew up in that environment. I was the youngest son of my father's second marriage, youngest of eight kids. And I remember growing up, man, my brothers could throw a mile. <laughs> I mean, they had a rocket arm. My brother uh, always said he was Dan Marino back when the Dolphins were good. Come on, guys, right? <laughs> uh, and, and literally, my, my brother, my, he had this rocket. I mean, he could whip it. I couldn't throw to save my life. For me to throw and hit that wall, I'm going to take two tries. Amen. And I remember like it was yesterday. That wall, my brother, too. That wall, he, not that he, one. <laughs> Maybe. I might be able to hit that one. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for building me up, baby. That's the worst. Amen. A anyway, listen. Did, did she not listen to the... No, I did Practice what you preach, right? I anyway, listen, guys. But uh, see... But, <laughs> but see... But see, then this is what we do is we justify. Well, it's true, though. <laughs> Anyways, we're going to... I told you we could preach a whole month on this topic alone. I remember like it was yesterday, my brother and I went to, in the backyard. That's some of the best football games in the world in the backyard, right? And I remember throwing, and, and, and even today, I can't throw. It, I throw my arm out immediately. And I remember my brother looking at me because he was mad at me because we were playing a football game, and I kept throwing interceptions. So my brother See? looks at me in front of everybody and says, man, you throw like a girl. Mm. You don't tell a dude that ever. No. I don't care if you're a, a kid, a grown man, or whatever. You don't speak that over somebody else, right? Because immediately we feel less than. Words are permanent. So you know what I did? I made up my mind because my brother cut me down in front of everybody. And every time I threw my, I threw my arm out, I made up my mind to never throw again in front of somebody. Never did. Can I tell you, I did not for decades because my shoulder bothered me so bad. So you know what I did? I said, I'm going to get so big by working out that I'm not going to have anybody worry or ask me 
to throw because I look like I can. Come on, guys. Yeah. And I later became all show and no go. Come on. <laughs> but it was later. He see, looks I like an impressive athlete. I look like I might be able to throw. <laughs> I'll fool everybody. Amen. But can I tell you today that I remember uh, several years ago, I went to the doctor because my shoulder was killing me. And the guy did an MRI and X-ray on my shoulder. He goes, can you throw? I said, Doc, no, I cannot. <laughs> he said, do you realize you have an abnormality in your shoulder? Your rotator cuff does not go in an arch. He said it goes like an upside-down triangle. He said your rotator cuff, the, the ball, the socket is continuing to beat in and out of your shoulder. You probably throw your arm out every time, don't you? I said, yes, I do. So I started feeling better about myself because I threw like a chick. Come on, guys. But can I tell you today Then he, that then he handed the phone words, to the doctor and said, can you call my brother Dale? Right. Can you no, call I'm my brother kidding. and tell him that? Listen, words are permanent. They will stay with you forever. Be careful what we speak. Amen. I would say that um, there, there was one very cutting remark that my brothers made um, to me about my weight when they came back from college. And I had already been struggling a little bit about um, myself and my, you know, and my body. And it was around my teenage years. And so things were getting wacky and emotions were going crazy, puberty and all that. And I remember they made one cutting comment when they came back from college about my weight. And I can honestly say that from that point forward, um, that is what I attribute. Not that it was their fault, but because they, they threw a tiny spark of a word on top of a forest that had already been built over time. Does that make sense? The trees were already there. The insecurities were already there. So that one word, that one spark set it afire, and that started my eating disorder. I decided on that day that I would never... I looked up to my brothers. They were my idols. I loved them. And what they thought of me meant so much to me. And I would definitely say that from that point on, I was very much more aware of, of my eating and of my body. And it developed into a massive eating disorder that nearly took my life. And so um, words are absolutely permanent. Can't get them back. And um, when we do recognize that they're doing harm, we've got to circle back and make sure that we speak life or the, where we spoke death, where we were used by the enemy to speak death. Let's do this real quick, and we've got to close. How do we avoid hurting people with our words? Number one, guys, we've got to pray. Put, can you put up Psalm 19 and 14, the thing that I sent you late, Andy? Um, last night. Uh, it's the girl um, uh, on the field. There you go. Um, this is a great verse. This is our prayer, guys. It's got to be our prayer every single day. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, because remember, they are joined. The words of my mouth, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, or my strength and my redeemer in the King James. That needs to be our prayer. If we start every day saying, Lord, I'm fixing to get out of bed, watch my mouth, help me with my heart, and make sure that everything that I do today is acceptable in your sight, Lord. And then here is a great way to be able to measure words before they come out, making harm and doing harm. Here's the thing. Let's take a look at the gates, the three gates. Um, I sent these late um, this morning because um, the Lord had brought them up to my remembrance. Here's three gates. Before you speak, let your words pass through these three gates. Number one, is it true? Okay, so what I just did with Anthony, it was true. He admitted it out of his own mouth. The boy can't throw. It is true. Now let's go to the second gate. Is it necessary? Is it really necessary for me to say that? No, it wasn't at all. I apparently was just trying to really drive home the sermon. But is it necessary? Uh-uh, it's not necessary. And here's where most of us get caught because a lot of times what we do that's so unnecessary is we will throw into a conversation something that's already happened. And what is so unnecessary is when we make a jabbing comment about, you know, I really wish you had done this differently. Well, you know what? I didn't do it differently. I already messed the bed on that, okay? It's not necessary for you to now say that. Does that make sense? Sometimes those comments, are, I really wish you had, but I didn't. If Cole's already trying to catch up with 19 um, assignments that he didn't finish and he's stressed out and about to cry, it does no good for one of the parents to walk into the room and say, you know what, you shoulda, da la la la, because you can't go back and rewind time. So that word is 
unnecessary. Let's just leave it at what it is and take it for where it's at and let's figure out whether or not we can move forward. Unnecessary. And then is it kind? Is it true? It might be. But is it really necessary to say? And is it kind? If it doesn't pass those three tests, we probably need to keep it inside of ourselves. We're going to end this on this. Listen, guys, since our words have potential to do good as well as harm, we can choose blessings or curses <clears throat> is what the Bible says. See, we can use our words to speak intentional blessings over people as well. See, the word bless means in the Greek, eulogio, which means to speak well of, to stand in the gap and ask God for direct goodness or uh, so God can direct goodness toward them. You realize Moses was given a command by God in Numbers chapter 6. Moses was told by God to tell Aaron and his sons to speak this blessing over the entire children of Israel. It's found in Numbers 6, 24 through 26. Let's read this. This is amazing. Here's a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That is our prayer today. That's what we're speaking over you as a body of believers today. Those words, not curses, but blessings in Jesus' name. Because words matter. Amen. 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 So that, um, we're going to end on this. Um, we're going to end on a song. Uh, we're going to go ahead and um, we're just going to pray this out. Because like I said, we can, we can take an entire month to preach on words because in all honesty, I think for some of us, words have hurt us and we're still dealing with the residuals of that. And we need healing over words that have been spoken o over us. You know, you're, you're not smart enough. You're not good enough. You're dumb. Those are words and they're very painful and they stay. They are, they're powerful and they do much damage and they stay forever and it affects and attacks our identity. So I think that we can go into um, an entire uh, month's worth of healing from words. Um, today, what we're gonna do is we're just going to close today out by recognizing, acknowledging what God's trying to say to this and that's this. Watch your, watch your mouth, watch your words. And more than anything, watch your heart. Because if you're noticing these red flags coming up, then we've got to examine where they come from. Amen. We've got to examine where they come from. I need to step up here for a minute. Come on. This is hard for 